Okay, so this uh, lecture is lecture 18. It's about linear programming. It's sort of part two. And whereas the last lecture was a little bit about like the theory of linear programming, this one is going to be a bit more about like applications of linear programming, sort of how you can use it for some combinatorial optimization problems. Uh, so maybe uh, as always, or maybe as we've been doing before, if you have questions, type them into the chat and I will periodically look down into the chat and answer the questions. Okay, so uh, Right, this one is gonna be a little bit more about practical problems. And indeed, linear programming was originally uh, discovered and developed by practical people uh, in several different areas. One of these people was uh, this person, George Danzig. It's a photo of him when he was a bit younger. So Danzig was a mathematician slash operations researcher in the, working in the 40s and 50s, and he developed the simplex, al simplex algorithm, which is a, practical algorithm for solving linear programs efficiently. It's not actually in polynomial time in theory, but it works well in practice. And he was really interested in applying it in practical scenarios. And there's a little anecdote I want to tell about him uh, that's relevant for today's lecture. So, uh, you know, as he was developing this theory, he was really excited about it. And he was a younger mathematician. He was invited to this uh, mathematics conference at the University of Wisconsin. And he gave a lecture about the topic called programming in a linear structure, which I guess meant linear programming. Uh, some of the applications were for like the US Army and like they really thought the term programming was cool. So the mathematicians agreed to call it that, um, which is why linear programming has this sort of a funny name. Anyway, uh, Danzig was there and in front of all these famous mathematicians, he delivered his lecture about linear programming. And you know, then at the end, when there's time for discussion, this other famous mathematician slash uh, economist, Hotelling, uh, stood up and like, you know, wanted to give a response to the lecture. And apparently he just said, you know, well, this, this lecture was all nice, but, you know, as we all know, the world is nonlinear. And then supposedly he just sat down and that was his repast to the lecture. And uh, Danzig, I guess, was a little flustered by this and didn't know what to say. But then uh, luckily the, the great John von Neumann was in the audience and he stood up and said, you know, I'd like to you know, respond on the speaker's behalf. And von Neumann says, you know, Danzig gave his, uh, the title of his lecture is like linear programming. He stated his assumptions clearly. If you have a problem that's, you know, the linear programming form, then great. You can just use, you know, his work. If it's not of this form, then don't use his work. Um, and this made, you know, Danzig very happy and relieved. And indeed, apparently, subsequent to this, he had this picture posted outside his office door. Um, Happiness is assuming the world is linear. And I bring this anecdote up because um, indeed this maxim that uh, von Neumann said is gonna be quite relevant. So sometimes you have a problem that's exactly formulated as a linear program and terrific. Then the fact that you know, linear programming is solvable in polynomial time means you can solve your problem efficiently. And you know, a little bit analogous to this assumption here, linear programming is so great that like, even if your problem is not linear, you should still see if you can like, corral it into some kind of linear program or use a linear program to try to help you solve it anyway. And so we're gonna see some examples of this later in the lecture as well. Okay, but let's start with a problem, uh, the max ST flow problem that uh, genuinely is gonna turn out to be just a linear programming problem. So what's the max ST flow problem? Uh, the input to the problem is a directed graph, G. Um, so here's an example. And you'll notice that there's some uh, numbers written on the directed edges here. And these are called capacities. Okay, so these uh, are denoted C sub UV for each edge UV in the graph. And these are positive numbers. Okay. And there's two special vertices called the source S, that's over here, and the sink or target T, it's over here. And what's the point? The point of this problem is that. Um, you're imagining that you're trying to ship stuff from S to T, and uh, you can ship like any amounts of stuff, you know, fractional amounts as well. Uh, but the amount of stuff you can ship across the directed edge is upper bounded by the capacity that labels that edge. And you're trying to get as much stuff from S to T as possible. Okay, so in fact, I believe the first person to study this problem was a chap called Tolstoy, not that Tolstoy, but another Tolstoy uh, who lived in the USSR and was working on it in 1930. And uh, his directed graph was really, you know, the vertices were like cities and towns in the Soviet Union and the directed edges were railroads. And, you know, maybe the, uh, the number, the capacity represented the amount of uh, 
stuff in tons that the, the railroads could ship. In particular, he was interested in cement. So like S was maybe like a city that had a cement factory and T was like a city that you know, needed cement, okay? And you had these railroads that can carry so much tons of uh, cement. And he was imagining, you know, what's the best steady state? If you know, this edge here represents that S can you know, tr transmit up to three tons of cement to uh, city A in a day, then in the long run, like how much uh, you know, transmission of cement should we have along all these edges, okay? And there's an important uh, constraint here that I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, but it's part of the title, which is the flow conservation constraint, which basically means that, you know, S is, you know, generating cement or stuff and T is accepting cement, but all the other cities are not generating or, you know, uh, taking in cement, they're just transmitting it. So the point is that for every um, vertex V, other than the source and the sink, um, the amount of stuff you're shipping to that vertex should be the same as the amount of stuff you're shipping out. So the incoming flow should equal the out outgoing flow. And now you're naturally trying to, you know, ship as much stuff out as you can. So it turns out this yellow uh, numbers I've written here is like the optimal solution for this specific instance. So you see S ships out two, you know, units to A and one unit to B and one unit to C. And like A gets two incoming units from S and it ships one of those out to D and it ships one of those out to B. And uh, B gets one incoming unit from S and one incoming unit from A, and it ships zero out to A and two out to E. So you see at every vertex, the amount of yellow coming in is the same as the amount of yellow going out, except at S and T. So S is shipping out two plus one plus one, which is four. And indeed, T is getting in three plus one, which is four. And so, uh, as I told you, this is the, max, the, the optimal solution. So the max ST flow here is four, okay? And uh, this is a natural optimization problem. Actually, you'll notice uh, there's something additionally special here about this particular instance. Um, I mentioned that all these numbers can be rational, they can be fractions, but a special thing actually happens in this problem when the capacities are integers. And the case of integer capacities kind of makes sense. Like if you imagine maybe these are like error, uh, you know, flights from cities, you know, a flight can carry an integer number of passengers, right? You cannot ship a fractional number of people. and as it turns out, uh, something that we'll eventually see is that when all the, in the capacities are integers, the optimal solution also has integers. But um, that's just a special case. And for now, think of this as like a, a divisible good. So fractions make sense, you know, like, you know, amounts of uh, tons of cement. Okay, um, good. So the great thing about this uh, problem the max, max ST flow problem is it's literally exactly an instance of optimization version of the linear programming problem. Uh, okay, so let's see why that's true. Um, so in the linear programming problem, we have um, variables. And in this problem, max ST flow, we're gonna have a variable called F sub UV, one for every directed edge UV in the graph. And this is supposed to represent the amount of flow along that edge, the amount of stuff being shipped along that edge. Okay, now we have some constraints and because it's linear programming, these uh, have to be inequality constraints. So one constraint we'll have is that these flows are non-negative. You can only ship a non-negative amount of stuff on an edge, of course. You know, the main constraint, the obvious constraint is called the capacity constraint. Oops. Uh, this says that the you know amount of flow you ship along the edge should be at most the capacity. So these Cs are not variables. They're fixed numbers that are part of the input to the problem. Uh, so this is also just an inequality on the variables f. And uh, this is the most important constraint. This is the flow conservation constraint. So let's take a quick look at it. It says, we're gonna have one of these constraints, which is actually an equality constraint. We're gonna have one of these for every vertex other than uh, the source and the sink. Remember, it's okay to have equality constraints in linear programming. This is just the conjunction of less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. And what does it say? For this vertex V, you look at all directed edges from U to V in the graph, and you sum uh, the flow variable F sub UV uh, for each of these directed edges. So this left-hand side captures in your solution defined by F, the amount of stuff flowing into V. And on the right-hand side here, the sum over W of uh, such that VW is an edge in the graph of F UV, this represents the amount of flow coming out of uh, V. And the flow conservation constraint says that these two quantities should be the same. 
Okay, and remember here, these, uh, we think of these variables as taking values in the reals, so it's perfectly possible to have um, you know, a real number, you know, a fractional solution. Although, of course, if the capacities are rational, you'll get um, the optimal solutions will be rational. And it's uh, not just one of these feasibility problems where you're trying to decide if the, there's a solution or not. There's always a, there always is a solution to this problem. You can set all the flows to zero, and then everything is fine. But you have an objective. You're trying to maximize. This represents the amount of flow out of S. Okay, and that's the thing you're trying to maximize. It's going to be equivalently the amount of flow um, into T. Actually, arguably, you should write another term in your objective function where you subtract the amount of flow into S. You know, our graph doesn't have any directed edges into S because they're kind of pointless. You would actually never want to ship flow into S if you're trying to maximize this. So you should probably actually subtract that amount of flow into S if you want uh, you know, to understand what the correct objective is for any flow that satisfies all the constraints. But when you're trying to maximize, there's no point in um, shipping stuff into S or like circulating things from S back into S. So we can just write this as the objective function. Okay, looks like no questions so far, but uh, just you can flag me down if you want to ask a question. Uh, okay, so uh, in some sense, that's it. We're done. This linear program exactly captures the combinatorial optimization problem, max ST flow. And so once you know, know that um, the linear programming can be solved in polynomial time, then you conclude that this optimization problem, max ST flow, can be solved in polynomial time as well. Okay, so that's um, a great application of linear programming. Now, as it turns out, there are non-linear programming based um, uh, efficient algorithms for this problem as well. Indeed, it was already shown by Ford and Fulkerson and others like in 1954 that there's a polynomial time algorithm for solving the max ST flow problem. This was done well before Kachian in 79 showed that linear programming is uh, solvable in polynomial time. But it just goes to show that like, um, you know, linear programming is like a cool like hammer you can use to try to solve a lot of optimization problems. I mean, uh, we just saw that this max ST flow problem is a special case of linear programming. So as soon as you, you know that linear programming is in P, you can solve this and other uh, optimization problems efficiently. Um, just a quick aside on this uh, subject, in particular, you, know, you too can do it in real life. Um, you know, all these programs that I uh, implored you to use in the first lecture, like Maple and Mathematica and MATLAB, there's all packages for all of them to solve linear programs. There's dedicated, you know, software like Cplex that you can get access to for solving huge linear programs. So indeed, um, they're very practical algorithms too. I mean, they don't use the uh, theoretical P algorithm for solving this ellipsoid algorithm for solving LPs. They are very optimized practical algorithms. So these problems are really, um, you know, once you show something can be solved with linear programming, it's truly practical to, to do it, even on huge linear programs with, you know, thousands and millions of variables. Okay, so uh, that's all I'm going to say about uh, max ST flow for a little while. Um, actually, let me mention one more uh, little anecdote. I mentioned that Ford and Fulkerson in 1954 uh, were writing about this max ST flow problem in English in America. And they also used like the railroad example as their generic example, but they made it very generic. They just said, oh, imagine you have a railroad system, and you're trying to ship things from here to there and so forth. And they, in their paper, thanked a guy called Ted Harris, who worked at the Rand Corporation, um, for suggesting the problem to him, for, to Ford and Fulkerson. And interestingly, it turns out that Ted Harris himself was specifically studying the railroad network in the Soviet Union. And that's why he cared about this problem and why he asked Ford and Fulkerson you know, for their mathematical ideas on it. And why the Americans were interested in studying the railroad network in the Soviet Union, you might think about as we um, go on, we'll in some sense come back to this later. 